You know, if you ask anyone who knows General Rick Hillier, they'll tell you it's like he was born to be a soldier. I mean, look at that. Even as a kid, ready to do battle. Although clearly his judgment not so hot. I mean, what's with that jersey, pal? But you know, even at that age, Hillier was looking to join the Canadian forces. He actually wrote letters to army recruiters when he was eight years old trying to enlist. And eventually his dream came true as he did enlist. And over 30 years or so, he rose up the ranks until he became the country's top soldier. That was back in 2005. And over the following three years, Hillier carved out a deep legacy. You see, more than anything, he stood up for his soldiers, demanding more funding, new equipment, and more respect. We could probably not give enough resources to the men and women to do all the things that we ask them to do. But we can give them too little, and that is what we are now doing. That kind of talk didn't always go over well with his political bosses in Ottawa, but Hillier never publicly bent. His passion and loyalty made people sit up and take notice, especially as the war in Afghanistan went on. And now, there's a renewed appreciation for the Canadian military at home and around the world, and Hillier is a big reason for that. A couple of years ago, the general retired and published his memoir, called The Soldier First. And now he's back with a new book, about leadership. I'm going to please welcome back to the program, General Rick Hillier. Hey, sir. Hey, George. How are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you. Glad okay. to be back. I've been happy. There's a lot I want to talk to you. Let me just get this right off the bat. At any point, do you plan on running to be the premier of Newfoundland or Labrador? Now, do you want me to make a straight out comment here right now? Yeah. After two and a half years of saying no, and yes. I'm not going to be a politician? Yeah, well, I know you said no, you're not going to be a politician, but there was a time. You know, Danny Williams is, is obviously stepping down, and that's a, he that's is, a huge and we're going to miss that awesome leader. And, you, and I know that you love good leaders, and you know that you have a lot of experience, and I know that, that the province, both Newfoundland and Labrador, are important to you. So I just flat out, I haven't heard you say to me, do you plan on at any point running? Uh, no, I don't plan uh, on running. I have no plan to run, George. Mm -hmm. and, and here's what I'll say. Newfoundland and Labrador has got some incredible leaders, both back on the island and across the rest of the country, and perhaps deed indeed around the world, we're going to find the right leader to, uh, to replace Danny Williams, who is incredible, and we're going to make sure that Newfoundland and Labrador is a strong province it needs to be inside of this awesome country, Canada. Okay. And it's probably not going to be Rick Hillier. Of the 50 points in the related stories that are in this book about leadership, where did you learn them? Uh, through 35 years, three months, two days, and eight hours of wearing a uniform. Eight hours. <laughs> but who's <laughs> yeah. counting? Yeah, right. no, that's when I retired on the 2nd of July, early afternoon. Yeah. Key elements, like surprising elements of being a great leader. Well, you know, it no, should be no surprises. I'm not telling any new I'm doing, refocusing folks. Point number one and point number 50. Point number one, it's all about people if you're a leader. You remember that. You focus on getting the right people in, attracting them, getting them trained, educated, inspiring them with a long-term vision, recognizing them when they do great things, being with them during their darkest times, and they will bring not only their body to work, but most importantly, they'll bring the mind with that body, and that will allow you to accomplish wonders, change the world, and you will be successful as a leader. Point number 50 is, if you forget the intervening 48 points, yeah. go back to point number one and remember it's all about people. You can't go wrong as a leader. Does compassion play a role as well? Absolutely. Yeah. You have to be real. And people don't want to see a robot as a leader. They want to see a real person. And they want, you know, to understand that you're an individual too. And compassion is a part of that. Mm -hmm. How you treat people. You know, I, like, I hugged every soldier I saw just about, for God's sake. You kissed some uh, of them, man. Yeah, I did. In fact, men and women. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you. So I like, uh, you know, you have to do everything equally. And you have to, sh and, and, and it's all part of being who you are. Mm -hmm. And people do want to see a real individual. And I think that can make you successful. And you obviously have to play it with a bit of an, you know, understanding of where you are in the context. What do you make of the WikiLeaks? Uh, I, I've really not followed this last set. The first set caused me some concerns because we always tried to set conditions where we asked young men and women to do tough, dangerous things. We had set conditions, reduced the risk to them to the minimum level and, and give them the greatest chance of being successful. Some of the things in the WikiLeaks might actually cause us or cause that risk to be higher than we would like and therefore might lead to a tragedy that we could have avoided if the information had not been out there. Now, I've heard that. Just because people, I think we hear people talk about it, but we don't understand how. How could something in the WikiLeaks, like this, this current stuff, how could it endanger a soldier? Well, not, not the last piece. I'm not talking about this last several days here. I'm talking about what happened yeah. back in June uh, because there were some things in there on the tactics, techniques, and procedures that you use when you do a hard knock or go through a door yeah. at night to look for a bubba well, who is a killer. Knock. What's a hard knock? Well, when you go and violently burst into a compound or, or you go to capture or get or kill, if necessary, mm -hmm. uh, a, a leader who is organizing people to kill innocent folks. And the tactics and techniques and procedures that you train and organize for, a lot of, a lot of things are covered in those WikiLeaks, and that could lead Taliban folks to actually go through that. We know they do. And actually be a little bit wiser as to how things will progress when it happens, and therefore the danger to... to uh, soldiers not just from Canada to be that much greater. What do you make of the uh, Prime Minister's decision to uh, 
redefine the Canadian um, uh, presence there in Afghanistan, but extend it beyond the 2011 deadline when a lot of us thought it was over for us? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, first of all, I don't know the details of the second part of that decision, if you will. Like I, we're going to do a training part? mission. Yeah. I have no details. I'm not sure anybody does at this point in time. I certainly do not. I'm not sure that there's a mission for 950 people in Kabul. Uh, actually, 950 Canadian soldiers up there, so I'm not sure what kind of training mission we'll have. And once I know the details, I could perhaps make an assessment whether it's credible or not credible sure. and then say, yeah, it's a good thing for Canada. When you were in this position, you, um, you, were, you had obviously close relationships or, or some kind of relationship with the Allies and everybody. I assume there was a flow of information. How much of this decision do you think is about keeping Allies happy? Because, well, you know, back home, people wanted those, the troops out. Yeah, and, and, but I think the Prime Minister himself articulated very clearly that this was a consequence of his al the allies of Canada pressuring Canada to stay in the mission and not be the first NATO country to leave the mission. And, and therefore, that's, that was, I, I'm pretty sure his words were that was why we were staying. Uh, so, yeah, there is a lot of pressure. Uh, but I will tell you that the allies valued Canada's contribution. Not contribution, not the word. The allies valued what Canada was doing in an enormous way powerfully and and great britain and and the united states of america and the other allies of nato uh, thought that what we were doing was incredibly well done it was incredibly needed and canada was right at the top echelon of nato countries doing uh, things in that mission what do you think of the perception that canadians have and and again this all comes back to the leadership idea yeah. because you because when you're in uh leadership is one of those words you hear but it's really hard to execute you've been in that position in a variety of different ways and so when you look back on the decisions that the canadian military made you made the government made um, why we're in Kandahar, all that stuff. When you look back at those decisions, did you make the right decisions? Uh, you know, I've, I've never second-guessed any decision that I had to make. Uh, I, I said to somebody a little while ago as I was writing the book that, you know, they were asking, were the decisions you had to make easy? I said, absolutely not. As chief of defense staff, every decision I made, almost without exception, was difficult. And the reason was is that all the easy decisions could be made by people who were empowered to do that. And so if I was making easy decisions, I was doing somebody else's job. Never second-guessed the decisions with the information we had at the time, with the best approach we had, made the right decisions as far as I'm concerned. So That's, not second-guess those, no. So second-guess is different, though, than looking back at, at what's worked, because many people think that, that this hasn't worked in Afghanistan. Well, and I would disagree with them, and I would say that in August and September, just this past several months, we actually crossed a tipping point in Afghanistan, where actually the United States strategy with the Obama administration uh, of pressuring and working with Pakistan to do more to take off the Taliban leadership hiding in Northwest Frontier, mm -hmm. to uh, develop the economy more coherently, get better government locally, little, still challenges in, in Kabul, but most importantly to build a security forces so they can actually run their own security, and that means the Taliban have been taken down. Their leadership has been really devastated, and so we've got a security space there we have not seen since 2004. But we're hearing stuff, even from the WikiLeaks about Pakistan, that they're not actually really um, uh, separating themselves from the Taliban. In fact, they're keeping them on their side because ultimately they need them on their side, so you have that reality, and that the hard knocks, the, the, as you said, the, the late-night bombing have um, killed a lot of the moderate um, Taliban members who are looking to come to the table, and so some of the tactics have actually created a bigger long-term problem in Afghanistan. Yeah, and the WikiLeaks have a lot of stuff in it about many of these things, I'm certain. Uh, most of the hard knocks have gone after serial killers, uh, the ones who have organized and planned the, the, uh, the attacks on international troops, innocent Afghanistans. Yes, there remains a challenge in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and that Pakistan has got to step up and realize that the Taliban that's in their country and the Taliban that's residing there but attacking into Afghanistan really do come together and are the main threat to Pakistan, and they do have to do more about them but they have done a heck of a lot more than the last time, in fact, that you and I had spoken. Do you think the public is naive about what it takes to be in uh, a war like this? Yeah, and I think that's a good thing. It yeah. means we live this awesome life in our country, the best country in the world. We live this incredible life in this incredible society with freedoms and privileges, and it would be abnormal if we were thinking about that kind of stuff all the time and understood it thoroughly. And so I think that people are a little bit naive because our daily existence leads us to that. You know, I wondered your, what, you, what you must have been thinking because the, the, the rationale for Afghanistan has changed much over the years. And you hear about, well, it's about democracy, then it's about girls in schools. Then it's, and it, this is ever-shifting rationale. And it never came from military leaders. It came from politicians. As it should. Right. But what, when you have to be there and, and then, you know, download this to the troops and you have to carry the mission forward, what did you think about the way that me was... The, the way the, government handled the selling of this war, and it's been a couple of governments. Well, it, very difficult to articulate, first of all, and very difficult to articulate eloquently and, and consistently and coherently over four or five or six years, and truthfully, it wasn't done that way. Mm -hmm. As you say, it was all over the place, and we had various reasons. As chief of defense staff, uh, and I don't speak for the present chief, but I, I believe he would have a similar opinion, it was never a challenge to talk to our troops, sailors, soldiers, airmen and airwomen, and say, look, here's our mission, here's what the government of Canada is asking us to do, and here's how we are going to go and do this. And i got to tell you, 
uh, somebody said to me a little while ago, you know, there are two kinds of soldiers in Canada's army right now, those in Afghanistan and those who want to be in Afghanistan because they believe in the mission. They got it. They understood what we're doing there in part because they see it with their very eyes. They see the devastation and, and, the, and the heavy yoke and burden that the Taliban are, and they see the danger that could come from that if that again becomes a fertile garden, a petri dish, if you will, for the, for the breeding of terrorists. Choosing Kandahar. You know, which, which a lot of people say that we put can Canadian troops. We, we're, the perception is we're doing a lot of the heavy lifting and taking a lot of the he heavy toll uh, in Kandahar. What, that decision, tell me about that. Well, I think it was a decision of the government of Canada. It wasn't a decision of Rick Hillier, but I, I will say I fully supported it. Kandahar was where the heavy lift ne lifting needed to be done. And, hey, we are a G8 nation, like, say, fine, a founding member of NATO. Uh, we are one of the very few nations that can do the spectrum of operations from peacekeeping right through to full-up combat operations, and that's what we needed down there, and Canada was the right nation to go in and do it. Uh, you know, a lot of people said, well, Canada is, is doing more than its sh uh, fair share, et cetera. And I said, you know, hey, we are that G8 nation. We are the best country in the world and the richest country in the world in a lot of ways. And, and really what we're doing is just stepping up and doing what we should be doing as a G8 nation was my view. And uh, I was proud to be a part of that. All right, so a guy that was leading uh, the, uh, you know, the military in this country and a guy that's written a book about leadership, we'll, uh, we'll get heavily into it with anthropology, right? We'll find out what he really thinks of a don't ask, don't tell. Anthropology with Ray Killier when we come back. Yeah. All right, back here with General... Rick Killier has got his book on leadership, 50 points of wisdom for today's leader. So our, our, our way to get points of, uh, of wisdom are through anthropology. Thra rapid fire questions. Okay, Your answers ahead. determine. Are you ready, sir? Never mind WikiLeaks. Ricky Leaks. What's one top military secret you're not supposed to share with us? Oh, anything about my family, because my wife commands me, and uh, <laughs> we, I, I refer to her as Commander Own Fleet, right? So uh, nothing about my family. How's your, how's your golf game? Uh, pretty miserable, yeah. actually. What's your lowest score? Uh, 83. That's not bad. No, it's not bad. It was a, it was a par three. That was the problem. Yeah, that yeah. was only the first nine holes. I didn't <laughs> count after that, right? Um, how's Brian Burke doing as a GM of the Leafs? I think he's doing okay. Brian is a leader. Yeah. Brian is a leader, and he's going to build the team that we want here in Toronto, win the bloody Stanley Cup, bring it back to Canada from the United States of America. My God, it's been done what, 17 years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it home. Boy, since you retired, you've started to lose your mind, haven't you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a constant optimist. I'm sure you are. Um, other than Canada, which, which country do you look at their military and go, man, they have the best soldiers. I like those soldiers. Well, you know, actually, there are probably, uh, probably four, and that's uh, United, well, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, and uh, the United States of America. Let's say in six years when we're fighting for natural resources, could we defeat Australia in a war? Because it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're far enough apart. We'll never have that little challenge. I mean, 12,000 miles of the Pacific should make, uh, make sure we'll never have to do it with that. We'll have a Navy and a Maritime Command. What's the one thing you miss about being a day-to-day -day soldier? Uh, actually, I do not miss anything. What I feared I would miss is the camaraderie of my battle buddies. We right. all think that. Reality is I haven't left that part. I see soldiers, sailors, airmen, airwomen, their family members, formers, former veterans, or so veterans, etc., mm -hmm. wherever I go. So right. that's the part I worry about. What do you make of the don't ask, don't tell policy? Well, you know, it, it's not an issue back here. Like, what we want are good Canadians who want to serve their country. Regardless and, of And any, regardless, yeah. and with good values, and we'll help you build the values even stronger if, if, the, if you join the Canadian Forces. And so that's what we believe in, that men and women come to serve their country, and they should have the opportunity to do it. And that's the part we worry about. Video games, great recruiting tool or misleading and too violent? Actually, I think it's, uh, it's probably a little of each, you know, that. Okay. And, and, but we don't... Uh, we don't in, inculcate uh, violence into our soldiers. We make them disciplined individuals who can actually make the right choice to do what they have to do with, in accordance with international law to accomplish a mission. And, and video games don't need to uh, be a part of that necessarily, but they are good for recruiting in some areas. Some sure they are, for sure. Okay, the book is called Leadership, 50 Points of Wisdom for Today's Leaders. Good to see you, General. Thank you very much. George, thank you very much. Real pleasure. Great Kelly on the program. Thank Sean, we're on the website. We'll see you next time.